To close out the day, we have an interesting panel. How can blockchain help connect the next billion? I'd like to welcome our panelists, Anda, Salima, Gavin, and Rajesh, along with Naroa as moderator. Just a couple of quick words on Naroa. Naroa Zuratula leads the mapping and tech work for Giga, UNICEF. Prior to UNICEF, Naroa lived and worked in various company, uh, lived and worked in various companies in Kenya from a startup that is trying to change the world, um, understanding agriculture, to a nonprofit empowering local entrepreneurs through access to finance. Nero holds a master's in electrical engineering from Stanford University and a master's in te telecommunications engineering from EHU UPB. Nero is also a proud EF fellow. Please join me in welcoming our panelists and Naroa. Good. Hi, hi everyone. Can you hear me? Perfect. Uh, thanks, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, especially, I know it's the last session of the day, uh, so we appreciate you being here. Uh, and we actually have a quiet, interesting, and diverse panel here, so I'm sure that you'll enjoy the time. As, as the title says, uh, we'll be talking about Giga and about how blockchain can help connect the next billion. Uh, but what, what's Giga? A Giga is a partnership between UNICEF and ITU to connect every school to the internet and every young person to, to information opportunity and choice. By connecting schools, we in one hand equip young people with the skills they need for their future, and at the same time, we build digital economies uh, for the communities that are around, uh, are around these schools. There are uh, many connectivity initiatives out there, I always say that uh, what's different and unique about Giga compared to others is that we use data and technology to make the whole process more efficient and more transparent, in particular blockchain technologies. And uh, that's, that's why we are here today. The, the panelists will have a discussion about the blockchain applications they are building and that they are implementing and deploying in different countries. Uh, the applications go all the way from staking, NFTs, tokens, smart contracts, and others. And uh, with further ado, I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves. OK, great. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Andan Naba. I serve as the Chief of Operations at the UCT Financial Innovation Hub, where we translate the latest academic research into novel blockchain applications. Before this, I served as an analyst at Convergence Partners, a TMT-focused private equity firm uh, focused on sub-Saharan Africa. And Great to be here. Thanks. Thanks, Narora, and great to be here also. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm Rajesh. I'm one of the founders of Launch Nodes, and our whole reason for being is to help people become self sufficient Ethereum stakers. So um, it's great to be here, and we're looking forward to sharing more. Um, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Salima Ba. I'm a state counsel um, from the Directorate of Science, Technology, and Innovation, which sit, sits within the office of the president of Sierra Leone. Um, I mainly, well, over the past two or so years, I've been um, leading the uh, project coordinator coordination as well as some of our policy work. Thank you. And uh, my name is uh, Gerben Keine. I work as the uh, blockchain lead for uh, Giga at UNICEF. Uh, thank you so much. Nice to be here. Um, so, Herben, let's start with you. you. You work at UNICEF, and UNICEF is not the type of organization that people would think of that's working on blockchain, that's building tech products. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Giga's tech team, uh, how it works, what type of work you do? Sure. So, um, Giga sits uh, inside the uh, Office of Innovation at, uh, at UNICEF and we're a kind of small team of like 40 people approximately and we operate kind of like a startup within uh, UNICEF itself. Um, are there any like blockchain developers in the room maybe? Could you guys stick your hands up? Ah, so uh, we're, we're growing our tech team. Uh, we actually have a position open right now uh, if you want to come talk to me afterwards. Um, but uh, Basically, so far we have um, connected approximately a million students uh, to the internet. 
Uh, and the challenge that we really face is how do we connect the next, uh, the next billion? So to do that, we see uh, blockchain sort of adding value in a couple of different ways. Uh, the first one is uh, we estimate uh, needing approximately $428 billion to connect uh, the, the world's schools. So our biggest sort of, uh, well, our first sort of use case is moving all this money around and getting it to the right places in a way that's transparent and efficient and, uh, and affordable. Um, the second option that we see uh, value in is uh, automating uh, payments for connectivity. So using smart contracts and monitoring connectivity in schools to automate payments to uh, internet service providers. Um, then we also focus on NFTs. So at the beginning of this year, we launched uh, uh, the UN's largest uh, NFT collection called Patchwork Kingdoms. Um, where all of the uh, royalty uh, goes to uh, fund Giga, uh, goes to help support Giga. Uh, so that's, that's, that's kind of a neat thing. Uh, and we're also working on follow-up projects uh, for that, uh, that, that particular project. Um, and we're also investigating um, inv like innovative financing uh, solutions to pay for the operational expenses of connectivity. So uh, one of them is connectivity credits. Uh, Another one is where we're looking at uh, using staking to allow people to, uh, uh, to stake their, their ETH and generate uh, returns for, uh, for paying for connectivity. Um, but basically, we work with governments um, to try to convince them to give us like a regulatory sandbox to try these things out, try them for the first time so that we can scale them up later and, uh, and deliver some impact. Um, so far, the most of the projects I mentioned are sort of in the MVP stage, um, and we're seeing some promising results, so we're looking really forward to, uh, to making an impact in the coming years. Cool. Perfect. As you said, I think for, the ones that, for people that are not familiar with UNICEF, uh, we operate in uh, one 90 countries, around 190 countries, and uh, something special or different about us is that we work very closely with government that all the uh, product solutions that Herman was describing, we uh, work closely with governments to implement them in country. Uh, and that's where Salima, uh, you come from the other side of the puzzle, where you sit within the government of Sierra Leone. Um, so I'd like to tell us uh, a bit about this unique or different uh, directorate of science and innovation that you have in your country, uh, how it was set up, how it impacted the innovation ecosystem in the country, and uh, the work you do. Um, sure. Um, so the Directorate of Science, Technology, and Innovation was established by the current government in 2018. And the main mandate is really to leverage the use of science, technology, and innovation to support the government deliver on its national development plan. So by that, we work across various um, sectors. And we've all, um, also developed a 10-year national innovation and digital strategy, which is our 10-year plan to digitally transform Sierra Leone. And we focus on three key areas, which is digital economy, digital identity, and digital governance. Um, and as I said, because of where we sit, we really um, in a space where we are in a position to work across various um, sectors. That includes the private sector. We work with various private sector partners in Sierra Leone, out of Sierra Leone, to really um, support the development of our local ecosystem because one of our aims is to really establish Sierra Leone as an innovation hub. Um, one of the works that we've done is to kind of work with the private sector to develop an ecosystem mapping of the innovation sector in Sierra Leone, so being able to know what the div different services and players are within the field. Um, other place where we work is we work with our um, public sector partners, that is all the different government ministries, departments and agencies, basically supporting them in the different work that they're doing, seeing how they can use science, tech and innovation to really achieve the government's um, agenda. And also, finally, one of the, our key areas where we work is our international development partners. We work with various international development partners, and one of our main partnerships has been with UNICEF from the start. Um, the UNICEF Innovation Office in Sierra Leone has been really key um, to the work that we've been trying to do. And one area where we've really worked closely is to support the government in its um, education agenda, which is really the flagship of the government's human capital development agenda, 
with um, we, so with that, we've really worked on various projects, um, such as Giga, which we're talking about today. We've also worked on other, um, actually, even before officially Giga was, an, was announced, we worked with UNICEF to um, map the geolocations of all the schools in Sierra Leone. So that was really key, as in laying the, found, um, the groundwork for the work that we're doing now with um, Giga. But then one of the other projects that we're really also proud of that we've worked with UNICEF Sierra Leone is on learning passports, which is really a partnership with Giga. They kind of go um, hand in hand. So um, that's kind of sort of the work that we do within the space in Sierra Leone. And so we're really um, happy and excited to be here. Awesome. And we'll be talking about some of this work in a little bit. Uh, before that, now we want to... Uh, oh, can you still hear me? Yeah. Uh, we want to announce an exciting project that we've been working on for the last year uh, in partnership with the Ethereum Foundation and the Rwandan government. Uh, it's the first time that we are publicly speaking about this, so we are quite excited about it. And yeah, the mic is yours. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you for that, Nora. Um So yes, um, I... We have a video coming up very shortly which kind of explains more about this project. Um, so rather than kind of spoil that, let me just give you the outcome. And the outcome is that Rwanda now has a solo staking infrastructure, which means that it can use staking rewards from staking Ethereum to fund internet connectivity in schools. And that's a world first and pretty exciting. Um, so yeah, that's been, that's been great. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is we're really now at a stage where the proof of concept's been running for a year. Um, it's been successful. Um, you know, we, we've seen the outcomes from that. Um, and we're inviting the broader ecosystem to get involved. So we want our competitors to get involved. We want um, you know, developers, we want other people involved in the Ethereum ecosystem to take up the baton now and to move this forward. Um, you know, no one entity can do this. Um, Giga has been fantastic in kind of catalyzing the whole program. We've had support from the Ethereum Foundation and elsewhere. But 50% um, you know, of schools in the developing world don't have internet connectivity right now. There's thousands of, uh, there's billions of dollars staked on the Ethereum network at the moment. Um, some small fraction of that could certainly help change, change lives. So that's really what we're, what we're saying here. Um, and I think the final piece really is to say, the technological aspects of this were one part of the project, but really the other challenge was um, you know, bringing people together, bringing people al along this journey. Two years ago, there was no such concept as Ethereum staking. It hadn't been launched. Um, and yet here we are, um, a, you know, effectively uh, two years on, and the Rwandan government has done something which no other country has done so far. And that didn't happen by accident. You know, it, it, there's been a lot of kind of negotiation, workshops, working groups, education sessions, briefings um, to bring us to this point. And in particular, um, leadership on the ground from the leader of, of UNICEF in country in Rwanda, Juliana, has been amazing. Um, Minister Ingabira has also uh, driven this project forward. We've had support from the Ministry of Education, um, Finance, um, you know, Central Bank of, of Rwanda um, and ICT and really everyone coming together and working collaboratively has made this happen and, and it's a model now that we hope we can um, scale across the world. Can, can I ask a quick sort of follow-up question about Please, that? Please, yeah, do. So I'm, I'm sure all of you guys are wondering like why is this so complicated? Like staking just makes sense, right? Like why, why aren't we doing this? So maybe can we talk a little bit about like why why is it so complicated to do this in in, in a country like Rwanda? Yeah. So so again, two years ago, staking wasn't even a thing. And if you imagine the complexity of getting anything changed in a country, it's it's pretty difficult. I think Salim has probably got more insight into uh, you know how to make that happen than than anyone else here. But um, you know, it does take regulation to change. It does take people to really grasp the concept. And you know, you know, we've been immersed in this for years, no doubt. A lot of the people here will have you know, been involved in um, Ethereum and other blockchains. Un explaining that to people and taking them on this journey isn't a straightforward thing. It takes a lot of courage, a lot of um, you know, bravery, really, to, to kind of adopt this as a concept and, and to take it to government departments and say, this is something we want to do. So a lot of that time hasn't been... 
um, installing servers and putting software on, on devices. It's been around the table and, and with your support and Neroas and others. Um, so that's, that's really why it's been complicated. Uh, and I'd say that it's also linked to the regulation around crypto, whether uh, a given country is allowed to hold crypto or not. Um, so linked to that, for this first pilot and after many back and forths, we decided that we're gonna uh, have the node hosted uh, on the cloud instead of locally. Uh, can you tell us about the why of this decision and uh, maybe elaborate also on the pros and cons of each of them, like uh, locally hosted versus cloud? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great point. Um, along this journey, there have been a, a range of kind of key decision points. What um, Ethereum client do we use? Where do we want the infrastructure to be hosted? Should it be cloud? Should it be um, you know, on-premise somewhere? Um, and I'll start by saying our whole philosophy kind of aligns very closely with the Ethereum Foundations, which is geographic diversity is key, and having diversity of, of kind of software client is, is really important as well. We don't want any, like, we, we don't want there to be too many people hosting in one particular place. That's, that's our strategy. Um, and the reason I stress solo staking is so important is because it makes people self-sufficient, which again is part of our, our approach. Um, so, for practical reasons, for speed reasons, um, for resiliency reasons, it made sense to use the cloud for the, the proof of concept effectively. Longer term, we want every school to have a node. We want everyone to be, um, you know, communities being able to stake and, and, and run their own infrastructure. Um, and that would be you know, a fantastic achievement when that happens. Long, long way there, but I agree with that. And Salima, she's one of the first ones starting uh, the, the journey towards that, that goal, uh, where in Sierra Leone you are actually uh, setting up or uh, in the process of setting up uh, a, lo a node that's locally hosted. Um, yeah, so I think um, we've gone, um, in terms of the proof of concept, I think we've started with looking at um, a physical um, hosting instead of cloud. But I think um, this is where collaboration, and one of the things actually we've also tried to do is um, an engagement with um, some of our other government uh, uh, around who are also doing the same thing. We've had a couple of engagements um, with the Rwanda government, and the p point is to really learn um, learn uh, together, learn lessons, and making sure that you know we're all working towards the same goal. Um, so for us, as I said, we've really looked at how we could um, lay the initial groundwork for hosting a physical um, um, node. Um, as you said, obviously, we want also want to be in the position where every school does have like a physical node, but we're, also, but we're not at that place yet, um, looking at um, the different challenges that we face. So one of the things which we wanted to do was looking at the possibility of hosting nodes with um, specific um, um, internet service providers. So for the initial preparation for that, we've kind of sourced um, the hardware that will be required. We have an agreement in place with one of our internet service providers who would also be one of the service providers actually providing connectivity um, to the school. Um, I think we're in the last stage of preparation and we're hoping, I think within the very near future, to officially launch a um, physical um, node. And yeah. Fantastic. No, that's great. And another thing that we're hoping is going to be the norm moving forward is internet service providers taking crypto as well as payment because you know the, what part of the hurdle right now is you'll have to convert from ethereum to fiat currency to pay for a service you know we've we've had conversations with isps where they've said no we'll happily take payment in ethereum and that i think will be the future uh, as well uh, just yeah, no. Um, I think same as in Sierra Leone, the conversations we've had with the ISPs has been very um, encouraging. I think um, where the conversations now is at is with our uh, other government um, partners, uh, public sector partners, looking at the national, the, the Bank of Sierra Leone who regulates that space, and um, the ministries of finance and that kind of sort of thing. Just making sure. I think um, I think the initial conversations around the legislative framework to do this kind of sort of thing. I think that's been the areas where we've been having the more conversations around, but then also look, making sure we have the um, infrastructure as well um, ready for that. Yeah. And another thing to mention, I think, is the roadmap for Ethereum clients means that 
it will be a lot easier to host nodes. You won't need, you know, the resiliency and, and the, you know, to store full versions of the blockchain in the future. So again, it's going to get easier and easier for people to host their own nodes, which is fantastic. What, what I find really interesting to, to sort of hear is, uh, it seems like everybody's kind of on board with this. Uh, everybody like thinks it's a good idea, but still it's like so difficult. So how do we, how do we talk to governments and help them understand and help them shape their policy? I don't know, Salima, do you have any insights in, 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 into that? Yeah, as a government representative, um, I think it's, it's a combination of a several factors in terms of um, why we currently don't have it and uh, what can be done. I think, um, for me, where I see, I think that it's about highlighting where the opportunities are um, with this. I think, first of all, the opportunities with regards to blockchain, um, especially when we talk about um, Giga and how that can be utilized for smart contracts and used to um, improve the relationship with internet service providers, provide better accountability and monitoring and transparency. I think um, highlighting those um, opportunities are, are great in terms of um, getting everybody on board. Um, but then I think also beyond that, there's a bigger opportunity with regards to most of these emerging technologies when you deal with um, the government or traditional governments such as ours, um, I think in, it's about um, opening up the space for learning. I think it's about improving the local expertise um, within our, our different nations, um, and it's about um, improving awareness. So one of the things we're excited at um, DSDI about um, Giga specifically is um, looking at, because we, we believe in leveraging the use of the most high-tech technology you can find, as well as the most, um, not low-tech, but the most useful for our current situations looking at. We also utilize things such as USSD and those kind of platforms because we consider our local context issues such as electricity, um, internet um, penetration rates. So all those are important, but with Giga and blockchain and possibly even looking at cryptocurrency to as payment, the opportunity for this, our government, is to pilot these technologies within a very small space, which will hope then um, raise awareness, allow us to learn about these emerging technologies, then use the data and evidence to really develop um, um, really effective um, legislative and regulatory frameworks that will better support and enhance this. So we want to get ahead of the pace. We know. Um, these technologies are coming, whether we like it or not. So the opportunity with this is really to provide a pilot where we can really use this as an opportunity to learn much more about it, which would then enable us to better um, regulate, regulate it. So I think that's where the opportunities and the learnings and it's about really showcasing that to get everybody on board. Exactly, and showing its value, right? Uh, one of the Challenges, I, I don't know if it's a challenge, but we usually face it that we have to communicate super technical and complex work uh, to, to people that are not technical and, or do, don't necessarily understand the technology. And what happens uh, sometimes is that if you mention the word crypto, smart contract, to someone that doesn't understand it, then uh, they, they get scared and they just say, no, we are not on board. So the moment you start proving it, starting small and making small things and uh, small steps, then I think they understand the value and they start becoming more comfortable. Uh, I guess from our side as well, on, on your point, coming from an emerging market like South Africa, to drive cryptocurrency adoption, you need to meet them halfway. So one of our PhD candidates has actually developed a solution where you can send cryptocurrency via USSD and SMS. We're still looking for use cases. We've spoken to one ISP who actually approached us saying, ooh, this could actually work, letting people in communities pay for, for internet connectivity. So those conversations are still ongoing. But that whole project made us realize that we can't just ideate in silos and think, you know, people from South Africa or from Sierra Leone or whatever who meet us halfway, we need to go to them and bring solutions to them. You know, be, even with speaking about blockchain and everything, they don't even have to necessarily know that there's a blockchain in the background. I always have this argument with people. They'll be like, you have to educate everyone about blockchain and this and that, but how many of us know how a light bulb works? <laughs> you know, you just know you turn it on. How many of us know how an aircon works? You just turn it on. So I think this, this, uh, you know, this view that you have to educate people about everything about blockchain and this and that for them to be on board, it is incorrect and we should rethink that. 
and I'm that, we've been uh, talking mostly about the public sector, but of course we also need the private sector and we need them to be on board uh, to, to make everything work. And we all know that uh, ISPs usually, uh, for them it's easy to go to cities, to, to urban areas, and it's harder, harder to convince them to go to more remote uh, community schools. Uh, from your experience working with the pr uh, private sector, what type of incentives, business models we need to, to make them also go to places that maybe are not as easy to connect? Yeah, I think, you know, there's obviously tax incentives that South Africa has now put into place, but one thing we looked at is just tokenization now of the last mile infrastructure. So maybe you could have a big private sector player, a private equity firm, put the capital expenditure at the beginning and then resell that after three or four years when their fund life cycle is now coming to an end to local communities, you know, and then the... Uh, revenue they're able to get in the interim can then sort of subsidize the resale price. So they may not need the large multiples that you need in terms of a general sale. And why something like that would also work very well, I know uh, we once invested in a fiber asset in, in Ghana and a few other countries, and we're struggling to now, but we were struggling to sell it now to a third party because we could only sell it in the sort of the 25% we owned it. But if we could tokenize that 25%, we could sell it to local ISPs, we could sell it to people you know, with ha who have extra money when I just want to help other people. But because the, I guess, the framework wasn't there yet, we weren't able to do that. So, you know, on your point as well, how much was it? 428 billion. And in Africa alone, it's $100 billion. We can't look to the financing mechanisms that we've done in the past to sort of solve future issues. We have to completely rethink how we do it. And things like blockchain and tokenization, I think, will be, you know, the, the key to doing that. I mean, absolutely, like nobody likes making banks even richer, right, so? Nope. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not me, no. Definitely not anyone at this conference either. <laughs> and uh, that's something that uh, Giga itself is experiencing as well, this tokenization and uh, building a token system that uh, where schools are granted a certain amount of tokens based on how difficult it is to connect them and then providers, if they decide to go to schools that are harder to connect, uh, they'll uh, get these tokens and uh, they'll be able to exchange these tokens for a set of incentives. Um, maybe uh, one thing there is that, again, for these incentives, we have to work with the public sector. So uh, I guess highlighting the necessity to work with all the players in, in, the, in the market, all the way from the private sector to the public, and have them have conversations uh, together. Yeah, I think as well, academia. So from, I now work at the University of Cape Town, and it's a, often it's a, pl a place that we don't consider. So we really now translate like, this sort of academic research from a PhD, master's level to blockchain applications. And I think we also need to come to the table now because you need a new way of thinking. Like I was saying, a private sector company that's been making huge margins from selling connectivity for 10 to 20 years, they're not going to change how they do it. You know, you need new people now to come to the table and challenge the status quo, which is what we're trying to do at the hub. Yeah, I think I think that, but I think that's a really interesting um, sort of contradiction because, on one hand, we have to like rethink all these things, and on the other hand, if you want people to sort of join you in, on the journey, you have to work with their systems and you have to, you know, make them understand yeah, that way. And, and I don't see it as. Um old world versus new world in the same way it sounds like you do. I think you know, big corporates are coming along f for the journey now increasingly. They're understanding what blockchain's about. They're looking at their own proof of concepts and pilots. Um, and, and yes, you know, they've got other motivations potentially, but um, you know, this, is, this is an opportunity for everyone, uh, the way we see it. And uh, Anda, you, you work, again, closely with startups uh, in the region. More in general, what are some of the trends around blockchain and around startups that you see in the African region? Uh, so around blockchain, we're now seeing less uh, financial sort of use cases. So we're now looking at a decentralized data marketplace where data creators can actually sell their data to other people. That could now be used to maybe find connectivity, for example. We also have an NFT startup that is working with content creators to let them share revenue based on their contribution to a work. So He's particularly working with uh, authors and wants to work with illustrators now. So if I write a chapter for a book, you write a chapter for a book, and my tree gets more views, we'll get remunerated more. So those are some of the interesting use cases we're seeing. The Mandla money one I explained earlier about the USSD cryptocurrency payments as well. It's on the financial side. So it's quite an exciting space. And I mean, our hub's only been operational for about 
18 months and we have six spin-off startups now that's just come from academic research which has been really beautiful to see maybe some people here that are in the unicef crypto fund could also source some of these startups no and you could um. share <laughs> <laughs> you, we, I'll, I'll connect you guys, yeah. You. Uh, and uh, Herven, following with trends, uh, before you spoke about some of the past work or work that uh, Giga has been doing, could you give us a sneak peek of what's coming next or what's next and some of the things that you are excited about for the next year? Yeah, for sure. So. Um the last year has really been about like building MVPs and talking with governments and getting them to allow us to do things. Um, and I think we've made like a lot of headway with that. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, we're now starting to roll out uh, a product called uh, Gig Accounts, which will allow um, payers for internet connectivity to monitor contracts, uh, get sort of real-time data about the performance of uh, the connectivity at schools, and then uh, uh, register payments for that. So we're quite keen to roll that out and what we're hoping to achieve over the next year for that is to um, start issuing our first sort of smart contract uh, contracts, I suppose. So the, the, the idea would be that an internet service provider would connect to school and then automatically receive payments if on internet connectivity is detected. So that way we can make it way easier for internet service providers to, to receive payments and uh, reduce a lot of a lot of overhead. So that's one of the projects that we're, we're, we're quite excited about, uh, uh, about progressing. Another one is um, we're building a sort of collection on top of our uh, existing NFT collection. The, the original NFT collection, Patchwork Kingdoms, that we, uh, that we launched was all about fundraising. So you, know, you, you purchase these, these tokens, you get a really cool sort of data-driven uh, art piece, uh, and, the, and the funds go to Giga to, uh, to, to help Giga connect schools. What we're building next is um, a collection where we will create an NFT for every single uh, school in the world um, and really not put the focus on uh, fundraising or raising as much money as possible, but instead sell these to people uh, who care about uh, the school communities, get them in the hands of the people who actually support these schools and create a sort of gamified platform where we will reward, uh, reward people for contributing data about these schools. So we'll create a crowdsourced data system for collecting school data. And the idea is to make the, the largest sort of decentralized school database in the world. Um, yeah. And uh, that raises many interesting questions, uh, such as uh, if you're crowdsourcing this data, what's the consensus mechanism that you'll be using to approve or to ensure quality of the data that you are gathering, and this type of like interesting new questions that we didn't have before. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, I've, I've learned a lot as, uh, at this conference about, uh, uh, about ideas like that. So it's been super useful uh, to, uh, to, to join this conference and, and, and learn more about that, uh, yeah. And uh, Herben, a follow-up. Uh, we, we've been saying that sometimes it's sort of like, it takes a lot of work to, to make changes within the government or make uh, government bodies to, to innovate. Uh, UNICEF, it's not a government, but it's also a huge organization that has many, many processes in place. How is it to uh, work in this type of things uh, within UNICEF? Um, yeah, you're, you're, you're right. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very big organization. I think um, I come from sort of the world of startups, uh, where things go super fast and you break stuff uh, and you try again. Uh, so that's certainly a that's certainly big difference. But I, th I always like to sort of compare the, the progress UNICEF makes as like glacial. So it's like super slow, but it's uh, unstoppable. So I think UNICEF uh, opens a lot of doors. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're talking with central banks and ministries about implementing some, some real change in, uh, in, in countries. And we're finding it really difficult to do that. So imagine being a, being a startup and trying to get a get a meeting with a central bank uh, governor to, to approve your well-intended sort of crypto project. So um, yeah, so I think UNICEF has, has an important role to play there in sort of opening the doors for these kinds of things, opening the minds of, uh, of governments and um, yeah, and, and allowing a lot of other startups to, to then make some real progress. And Salim, any advice on how to yeah, uh, maybe interact or uh, get that difficult meeting that Erben was talking about. Um, yeah, please. 
Um, yeah, sure. And I think um, one of the things I'll say looking at the model that we have in Sierra Leone is I think uh, not, it's not just because I work there, but I think having a institutions such as like the Directorate of Science, Tech and Innovation in Sierra Leone has been really key. Um, I think especially when you work within uh, uh, developing countries such as Sierra Leone where science, tech and innovation has not been a big player and the local expertise is not there, I think one of the, if I would advise, I think one of the key things would, would be for each government to have um, uh, its version of a DSDI, as we call it, because I think it really... Um, cuts across and really enables that partnership um, to develop. Um, I think we're lucky within the SDI to um, sit as we call play with um, various different individuals. We have lawyers, we have our developers, we have our data scientists, we have our policy advisors, and all of these individuals sit and enable us to do what we do. And I think that's why we were able to really form an effective partnership with UNICEF Sierra Leone and the innovation office. I think um, in terms of having one of the few like innovation work plans um, and work plans out there with UNICEF, I think that's been really key. And I think we kind of play the role with UNICEF of we develop our projects together, we establish our goals, and then uh, DSDI plays the role of fronting with the government on behalf uh, um, of UNICEF. So we would go to our government partners. And I think also the fact that we sit within the office of the president of Sierra Leone gives us a lot of leverage in terms of when we go and knock on those doors, like the National Bank of Sierra Leone to say, um, together with UNICEF, there's this great projects which we want to try out, deals with blockchain and crypto, could you please, um, you know, engage with us with us on it? And they're willing to do that. So I think for me, what's really important is having that very high government and political buy-in um, into um, these kind of things. And then, and even with us, even though we do, we have our challenges. But I could just imagine having to do this or trying to do this in countries that don't have that high level government buy-in that could um, potentially be very difficult. So I think um, one of the key things that have been useful to us or have enabled us to have a lot of the progress that we have is having that um, um, seat and being able to interface with UNICEF, with our government development partners, with the private sector, with other international development partners. So being like in the middle of all of that and being able to coordinate it. I think that's been one of the key things. It's a model maybe to learn from and replicate in other places. Uh, yeah, it's interesting, we met with the Colombia team earlier this week and uh, we were talking about the types of things that we could do together, how to start working in different aspects uh, that we were discussing and what we were told is that here it's actually quite difficult because they don't have uh, this type of coordinating body that uh, you have in Sierra Leone. Uh, what they were telling us is that there are Ministry of Education, Bank, Ministry of ICT, that each of them work on their own and that it's difficult to coordinate the work across all of them. Yeah, and I think maybe just a quick nugget, uh, I think, which will be interesting. Actually, so the Chief Innovation Officer of Sierra Leone, who effectively leads um, DSDI, is also the current Minister of Basic and Senior Secondary Education. And a lot of our projects, as I mentioned, do deal with education. So I think that gives us an added leverage in terms of really being in the critical space to be able to coordinate um, all of these um, activities. So, yeah. Yeah, so a lot to learn, definitely, and it's been a, we've been working with you for uh, many years now, and I think that the things that we've achieved uh, wouldn't have been possible otherwise. Um, maybe as follow-up questions to both of you, what would be the main opportunities that you see uh, with blockchain in your context? Um, yeah, from tokenization, like I spoke about earlier, we're also looking at blockchain actually for dynamic spectrum sharing. Because in South Africa, a lot of the spectrum is owned by the large MNOs, but, and the small players don't have enough capital to obviously partake at the auction. But there is sort of times during the, the day where spectrum isn't that used by the big MNOs. So we're looking at now using blockchain for dynamic spectrum sharing, where an ISP in a small town like Gramstown, where I went to high school, can now use spectrum from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. You know, at a lower cost than what they sort of use it during the day. So that's one interesting use case we're looking at it, I guess, in this context. Yeah. 
uh, thinking out loud, uh, would it be possible maybe to do something similar also with pricing for connectivity, depending and uh, apply something similar to that? Yes, so the pricing now would uh, be dependent on how much the ISP would get the spectrum for, and obviously when it's underutilized, the pricing would be less. So I guess that's the key problem. So it's still very early stages. The government announced it a few months back, and we just now started writing a few concept papers to see what we could do. But that would be the model, but we're hoping we can move forward with it. And yeah, so from my side, I'm very much kind of immersed in the world of staking and just the possibilities that every individual can be supporting this network and can gain rewards from doing that. So whether it's a small community or a school or a project for climate change, we just see the march of technology enabling that more and more. So you know, we're working with a range of entities who want to use staking returns for different things. The beauty of this model, as opposed to traditional kind of philanthropy, is that you can put your money on a node, use that node for good, and then take your money away later and put it, do other things with it. So it's not a case that you have to donate and, and your money's gone forever. And I think that's quite appealing when the, you know, the, the need for capital for some of these projects is so vast. So yeah, the, there's lots of exciting uh, kind of technological developments. We're just excited to be part of it. And then as you said, maybe it's not huge values, but uh, you're gonna start distributing and decentralizing uh, this hosting and uh, each school could have one node where the, the revenue maybe it's not huge, but enough maybe to pay for uh, internet in the wrong school. Absolutely, and, and you know, different models as well. So we touched on liquid staking, for example, right now it, do it doesn't have to be the case that every school needs 32 Ethereum um, for its own school or multiples thereof. There could be you know, liquid staking across Rwanda or um, South Africa or Sierra Leone and different entities have different amounts but they all gain staking rewards. So there's a lot of different avenues that this could um, progress through. Anything you'd like to add? Any of you? Um, yeah, so I think the, the, the biggest opportunity I see is in um, moving all this money around. Uh, so um, paying for internet connectivity in countries that may uh, have like a lot of corruption or something like that, I think blockchain can really provide a lot of transparency in that and a lot of fairness in that. Uh, so I think, I think that's, a, that, that's a huge opportunity. Um, yeah, I think um, going off, especially with the um, smart contracts and the real-time connectivity monitoring, I think um, for us those have been really exciting on both ends. I am the private sector specifically are also excited about the fact of having a smart contract and there's no discrepancy of whether how much connectivity did I actually provide in that back and forth exchange. So. Um, that's been exciting on the private sector space because actually so we have been in the process of connecting some of the schools which currently have connectivity to that platform to be able to monitor um, in real time. But then from a government perspective, it's also very um, important for us being able to really hold ISPs accountable to their service contracts that they signed because before, if you have no way of really monitoring the connectivity that they provided, you're just really paying out without being absolutely sure that what you're paying for was um, delivered. Um, so for a government perspective, that's been um, really um, important and one of the, the areas which we're really looking forward to um, exploring a bit more. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, because usually what's the case is that uh, for a lot of these schools, the connectivity is paid for by a government or you know, a UNICEF country office or something like that, and then one person is responsible for monitoring 150 schools or 1,000 schools, and it just becomes impossible to sort of check whether the connectivity is actually delivered. And the schools themselves have no negotiating, no negotiating power with their internet service providers. So, um, yeah, one of the products that we're offering to schools is this sort of application that they can install themselves on their network that will uh, provide us with uh, real-time internet connectivity data. So it's really a tool for them to sort of take control uh, over that and allow a huge body like UNICEF to put their weight around uh, making sure that internet service providers are providing the connectivity that schools deserve. I hope that you all learned as much as I did. Uh, maybe if you can go to the, yeah, to the next slide. Oh, we have too many tabs open. Yeah, the, let's try the video now. Um, yeah, I asked to say that uh, if any of the things that we spoke about uh, seemed interesting to you, 
uh, whether you are interested in joining our team, working with us, uh, scan that QR code and sign up so that we keep you in our uh, network and we can uh, count on you in case you need your help. And yeah, the last thing is that we had a video that we wanted to show. It's not appearing here though, uh, so I don't know if someone would. Delivering solar connectivity with Ethereum staking. Giga is a global initiative to connect every school to the internet and every young person to information, opportunity, and choice. Giga is leading innovative models and mechanisms to finance school internet connectivity over long periods of time, working in partnership with governments to build the right capabilities for the future. Giga and the Ethereum Foundation are collaborating on an exciting and innovative approach to fund school connectivity. Giga wants to use Ethereum staking as a new sustainable model to generate income to find long-term social impact. Blockchains like Ethereum allow individuals and organizations to contribute to network security, availability and processing power by staking funds while running their own nodes within the network. In return for providing this service, participants earn staking rewards. Ethereum is the most widely used smart contract capable blockchain and is now a proof-of-stake blockchain which effectively eliminated the energy usage that was associated with its former proof-of-work model. Anyone who commits 32 ether can benefit from staking rewards. This model of staking provides regular rewards over many months and years, enabling a wide range of different use cases that can deliver societal benefits and social impact from the money that is earned. Giga is working with the Ethereum Foundation and the government of Rwanda to provide the first example, providing funding for school connectivity in Rwanda. Launch Nodes is an institutional provider of investment-grade Ethereum, solo staking products and services, and was the implementation partner for this pilot project in Rwanda. How does it work? Number one, people and organizations that are interested in supporting school connectivity, who we call social stakers, commit Ether. Number two, Giga stake the Ether by running validator nodes. Number three, the rewards generated from the nodes are used to pay ISPs on an ongoing basis to enable school connectivity over the long term. Number four, after the agreed staking period, the original Ether can be returned to the social staker or continue to be staked for ongoing school's connectivity. Number five, the value of the Ether may rise or fall over the staking period. Giga has donated the first 32 Ether for staking, enabling the rewards to pay for connectivity at pilot schools in Rwanda. In the future, Giga plans to allow people to pledge less than 32 Ether, which can be pooled and staked to support Giga. This is a future functionality that is not live today. Giga is setting up Ethereum validator nodes for schools in Rwanda in partnership with the Rwandan government. Thanks. And I think, yeah, with peace applause, we can wrap up the, the panel. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you.